So hello everyone. It is uh, 1259. Um, I'd like to welcome you. Our presentation is about to begin. Uh, this session will be recorded and will last 60 minutes. So please keep your mic muted during the presentation and turn off your web cameras. If you have a question or comment, uh, please enter it into the chat during the presentation and your question will be addressed by the presenters at the end. If you are joining us on a phone or mobile device, you will be given an opportunity during the question and answer time to voice your questions or comments. All participants in today's event will have access to the recorded version, which will be available within two days after the live event. So TESOL International's program, administra in program administration intersection is pleased to present this webinar titled Innovating and Adapting Programs and Materials When Everything is Changing. Our speakers for today are Rosario Geraldes, Eric Moore, Pamela Smart-Smith, Michael Joseph Ennis, Daniel Brengel, and Jessica Hill in order that they will be presenting. My name is Lee Schwartz, and I am the current co-chair of the program administration interest section, along with my colleague, Tracy McGee, who is also joining us today. And it is now my pleasure to introduce my first speaker, uh, Rosario Geraldes. Well, hello everyone from Uruguay, and welcome to the program. Um, my name is Rosario Giraldes, and uh, uh, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you now. And uh, so that you know where Uruguay, you can see Uruguay in the map uh, here. Can you see it? I hope so. I am the academic director of Alianza Cultural Uruguay Estados Unidos, which is a binational center uh, whose headquarters are located in Montevideo. We are a network of 36 centers and we teach uh, mainly ESL programs. We also have a uh, teacher education program. Um, now, uh, let me share a little bit with you our approach to development of new program. Uh, we do ongoing research of programs and uh, um, to do that we involve staff so we listen to our teachers voices and our directors voices as well um, uh, to, we have our high standards and to meet them we focus on what we uh, believe are our exit objectives of our programs and uh, we design exit assess uh, assessment instruments that will measure whether these objectives are being met and thus that our high standards are being met as well. Uh, we compare results across the different programs. Uh, so sometimes we use the same instruments for different programs. Um, well, now I'd I would like to share uh, some information about our experience uh, in the past few years, and I guess this is not only uh, pertaining to Uruguay, uh, our enrollment decreased and uh, we needed to find other sources of income. Uh, and we, uh, one of the things we did at the very beginning was to research the market demands. So. We, there were um, a, a sector of the, there was a sector of the population we were not reaching and we wanted to know why. Well, what we discovered was that uh, we needed to offer lower cost courses and uh, we considered feedback from uh, our center directors, our teachers and our students uh, themselves. And uh, we made these adjustments in the last, let's say, 10 years or so. And we moved, at the beginning, we moved from regular to intensive courses. Uh, and we did this by condensing the hours in yearly courses. Uh, then we decided to move from face-to-face -to, -face to blended courses. And we designed a program called Alianza 3.0. To do this, we replicated the face-to-face -face classes in the online environments and uh, providing asynchronous work. 
after that, we move from blended intensive to face-to-face, -face slower paced programs, and we call a uh, flex program. And uh, to do this, we deconstructed the intensive program uh, into several slower paced, face-to-face, -face, shorter courses. And uh, the last uh, program we designed was moving from the blended uh, to the fully online courses. And uh, we have the MicroFlex program going on as of this year. What we did here was to replicate the blended design in the online environment. And we included weekly synchronous uh, contacts that, were uh, that are virtually. So the two most uh, recent experiences we have involved repackaging or packaging programs differently. Uh, in two, uh, let's say 2017 uh, was when we reduced weekly hours and increased the length of courses because we needed to produce lower cost courses to reach an audience, a sector of the population we were not reaching. And we had good results in terms of enrollment and in, in terms of uh, students' skills and abilities. Uh, and this year we had planned, uh, and it was by coincidence, that we had planned to design a fully online course, which uh, came to be really timely. Uh, and what we did was to design multi-level fully online courses that had a virtual component that was held synchronously. So there, was, there is a, a virtual contact every week. Uh, we use the platform Google Meet for this synchronous contact. And uh, at this moment, we are finishing the first edition of these programs. Again, this, this one is also a shorter term program and uh, it's lower cost because, uh, because it is shorter, because the number of contact hours are, are, are uh, let's say, fewer than in other programs. Uh, as I said, we uh, measure results of programs and one of the instruments we use to measure results is to administer surveys. So we ask our students uh, for their appraisal of some of the uh, aspects of our courses. One of them is, uh, well, to what extent they are satisfied with the course they have taken. And here you have a comparison between FLEX, which is the slower paced course uh, that's uh, held face to face. This year we moved this face to first to virtual and the microflex, which is the fully online. And uh, as you see, for the appraisal of the course is very similar in the graph. Uh, we also ask students to uh, express how uh, the teachers are meeting their expectations. And uh, as you see, uh, there is, um, a uh, high degree of satisfaction in both programs. Uh, and I'd like to point out, and in the case of the fully online program, the appraisal of the teacher has no, uh, that zero percent did not meet expectations. And which is really significant considering that sometimes in online program, it's more difficult to reach students. Um, other two points we ask students to um, uh, express their opinions is uh, regarding materials and regarding the virtual classes. As you see in these graphs for the FLEX program, um, most of the students were satisfied with the materials. Only 3% uh, expressed some degree of dissatisfaction. In, uh, however, in the MicroFlex uh, course, the one that's taken fully online, the degree uh, is the degree of satisfaction is high, but there's a 10% uh, of students saying that the materials did not meet their expectations. So this is something we need to work on, and we are presently planning on some actions uh, to to pre precisely to tackle that. And regarding the virtual classes. Um, it, we were expecting somehow these results for the flex virtual classes. I mean, these students were really uh, expecting a face-to-face -face contact and they were forced because of the pandemics, they were forced to have virtual classes. 
So there is 17% uh, of the students were, that were not really happy with the virtual class. However, um, let's say that 63% uh, uh, found that the, it, the, the virtual classes met their expectations, whether almost 20% mentioned that, that the virtual class exceeded their expectations. And uh, the virtual classes for the MicroFlex program, which would be held virtually uh, no matter whether we had a pandemic or not, okay, most of the students said that the virtual classes uh, met their expectation. Only 5.8% expressed some uh, degree of dissatisfaction. So uh, to conclude, I, I would say that, uh, well, we, um, we always have uh, needs as our focus. We um, research needs and uh, we conduct needs analysis to see what programs we need to design and what we need to improve as well. Uh, we bear in mind objectives, so where we want to go and we consider the, our end first. Uh, we foster thinking outside the box because we feel that thinking outside the box leads to innovation and change. Uh, we involve staff in this uh, process of designing and looking for alternatives and uh, as much as possible in the decision-making uh, process as well. We believe that's uh, a key factor uh, when, when, when the staff is involved, the chances of success of a program uh, raise indefinitely uh, or invariably, I should say. Uh, we measure results and we compare results from different programs to see whether we are meeting standards and we make changes accordingly uh, based on the results that we have and the feedback we get from our students. Well, uh, that's my part. Thank you very much. And now I will um, hand it over to Lisa again. Again, thank you very much for that very interesting uh, presentation and very timely as well. Um, I would like to introduce our, our next two presenters, uh, Eric Moore and Pamela Smart-Smith, who will be uh, showing us how they innovate their programs and materials. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Moore, and uh, my colleague Pamela Smart-Smith is with me. It's a pleasure to talk with you. Okay. And um, we're going to talk about uh, multi-level classes and the, uh, the problems that, and possibly some of the good parts that come up with that. Yeah. Okay, so um, first, yeah, we are um, with like intensive English programs where we're shrinking. Um, the numbers have gone down double digit amounts over the last several years, 20%, uh, 18.7, um, et cetera. And um, given the current situation, whether it's uh, health-related, political, um, et cetera, there, this trend is likely to continue going downwards, creating more issues for programs to, um, to stay afloat. Okay, so um, we must adapt and keep, keep on adapting. Um, certain things we need to think about are uh, how are we going to recruit from a distance um, when there's no travel involved or very little travel. Um, finding ways to keep our standards high, but also um, our budgets down. <laughs> and um, again, adapting to the social, political, and economic landscape. Okay. Also changes in, uh, we're based with a University of Virginia Tech, um, changes at the university um, with our faculty, uh, curriculum, everything we may need to, uh, to keep in mind. Some of the challenges um, we've had here at the Virginia Tech Language and Culture Institute, or the LCI, um, the challenges listed here, um, even before the COVID-19, um, we were having in declining enrollment numbers for the last couple of years in the intensive English program. Um, we have a uh, undergraduate pathways program called Advantage VT, and now um, Pamela actually will be heading, a, or is heading a uh, Advantage VT master's program also. And um, this, the undergraduate one right now, the, the Advantage VT is helping to level out the numbers right now. We're able to rebound with that program. 
but the intensive English program has, you know, has decreased over the last several years. Um, some of the things that are important with uh, big challenges are for our, not just our faculty, not just our staff, and not just administrators are asked to do more or even a lot more <laughs> with, uh, with less time, less resources, staffing. Um, I'm currently the interim uh, director of the Intensive English program. I've also, for the last several years, been the testing and course assessment coordinator, working with all incoming testing, TOEFL, et cetera. Um, I'm now teaching half-time in the program, and um, to top that all off, I'm also the emergency director for our program for representing the university. Um, Pamela has now become, um, due to some people leaving, and then with the COVID-19, we're not able to hire or bring any new people in. She's happens to sort of be our business person and human resources person at the same moment that she's starting a brand new program. These are some serious challenges for all of us. I'm sure the same things are happening probably where you are. Um, morale is hard to maintain. I've had it myself. I worked, you know, full day yesterday just trying to catch up before Monday came around and the email avalanche for all the different things started again. Okay, and um, shrinking numbers have met the needs um, meant the need to change how we approach teaching. What we wanted to focus today was on multi-level classes. So let's take a look at that a little further. Okay, um, so the challenges are pretty well known as far as having multi-level classes. Um, you know, resources and materials that, that work for both levels. Um, as you can see from the list here, um, there's, there are a lot of challenges. Um, we do maybe even need training for faculty members, especially, but even for students, perhaps, to get used to the idea that some people in their classes will be at, be at a higher or a lower level than they are. Um, planning for instructors, almost like planning two different lessons, um, can be very time consuming. Um, one level we have that are, we're running right now has two students in one level, four in the other but the instructor said it still takes her quite a long time to, to, you know, to finish this up, uh, lesson plans each week. But there are some advantages, as you can see from the list provided here. One of the great ones, I think, is the bottom one. It allows mentors in the class, students get to kind of have a mentoring role, and it can reinforce learned structures. For example, we have something at Grammar Fair where um, higher level students will take a, um, perhaps like a, a grammatic, or yeah, like a grammatical, you know, concept, and then they'll, they'll teach lower level students. It reinforces learning for them, and then it, it um, helps the younger, or not the younger, but the uh, lower level students to, to learn the concepts and to hear it from someone else. Um, I'm going to pass the baton on to my colleague um, Pamela at this time and let her continue on. Okay, hopefully I'm going to be able to transition from uh, trying to figure, where's my, where's my sharing? <laughs> Sorry, it's supposed to be a smooth transition, but uh, apparently I uh, I can't find my share button. Eric, you might have to share and then let me move on because I cannot find it. There, just go ahead and click through. So, <laughs> okay. I'll just say next. All right, so like Eric said before, one of the things that we wanted to focus on um, and we were originally going to focus on was talking about how we combine levels because we know a lot of um, schools are having to do this. And I remember even being in, in an assistant director's meeting at TESOL even two years ago <clears throat> and having this issue come up. And one organization even had three levels in one class. And so, you know, this is something that in K through 12 is more common because you often have um, newcomers and you often have, you know, level one, twos and threes in the same class. So it's a little bit, um, but it's not something that you normally have seen as much in IEPs, even though you do have some different, there's different levels even within your, your one main level, but not extreme ones. So um, one of the things that we had to do when we were taking a look at combining levels was to really prioritize our outcomes. We had to decide what outcomes were the most important and realize that we may not be able to hit every exact, we have a ton of grammar outcomes, so we, didn't, we may not be able to hit every single one. Um, and we needed to also visualize our outcomes and create materials that would help students achieve that goal. And 
this is often t tough with students because our lower level students are like, well, why are we in here with this upper level student and this is too hard and then the upper level students can sometimes complain and be upset because they're they're taking time to sometimes translate or to help the, the other lower level students and it's frustrating for them. So navigating that and being able to let them see how they're gaining from the experience is a tough thing that we have to do. Um, one suggestion that we have is to be able to streamline and organize the formatting um, and resources. Students can get hit with too much stuff at once and differentiating your outcomes, materials, assessment, and lessons, and scaffolding visual aids and activating prior knowledge by modeling. Next screen, Eric. All right, and I'm not going to read over all this because we only have um, two minutes, so I'm going to go really quickly. Um, expectations for students are important. Communicating expectations for faculty as well as students. Um, and making sure that, you know, one of the things we can do with assessment is to level. And if you have questions about that, you can send us a, a message and Eric and I can help explain how that do is done. Um, just go ahead and go to the next one. All right. Um, we also use themes or project based learning to teach vocabulary and context and then differentiate out so that you're not double teaching everything at the same time. Uh, so you teach one main area and then you go out into your small smaller groups or instructions or stations. If you're in, if you have a low number of students and you're in a classroom, you can divide them out into stations. Um, with online learning, you can do breakout rooms and that helps a lot actually. And um, even faculty in K through 12 that I've talked to have said that that has made it easier in some ways. Um, provide stuff for students to do if they finish an assignment. Uh, you have to provide professional development because not all students are, um, not all students are comfortable, <coughs> sorry, with, um, I mean, not all teachers are comfortable with what um, they're doing. In an ideal situation, you want to find volunteers and student teachers or aides. If you have access to student teachers, they can be a great resource. And yes, these lower levels and these combining levels, even at an upper or lower level, takes a lot more time. And being aware of that as an administrator and as a former teacher and faculty member is really important. Eric, next one. Um, and uh, there's a, obviously a lot that I haven't covered and is, we can't really cover in 10 minutes, but you know, uncertainty is tough for everyone, even if you thrive on change. I love change. Not everyone does, but it's still really hard. Um, we always need to continue to innovate and adapt, hence our master's pathway program. And, you know, we plan for every possible scenario and multi-level classes are just part of it. Um, and I hope, you know, ideally that we won't have to do that in the future so much. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as someone who is a faculty member and an administrator in an IEP, I uh, learned a lot uh, from your presentation and it's a context uh, very familiar to me. And we're moving on to what I find is a absolutely fascinating context. Um, Michael Ennis um, currently teaches in a uh, trilingual university and um, he will tell you about how he has done some curricular innovations. Oh, there we go. Now I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. Okay, so good evening where I am, good afternoon where um, some of you are in the United States and North and South America. Um, my name is Michael Ennis. I'm the English language uh, coordinator at the Free University of Boats in Botano. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the innovations that uh, originally I was going to talk about the innovations that uh, we have been implementing in the last couple of years in the way of curriculum monitoring, uh, adopting a big data approach to curriculum monitoring. Um, but given the current circumstances, I think I would I should also talk about some of the uh, innovations we have been making in response to the disruption caused by the, the, the global pandemic. 
Um, so we are a trilingual university at the Free University of Boats and Bolzano. It's a very unique context. I'm going to rush through some background um, really quickly. I could talk for 20 minutes about our context, um, but I'm going to rush through it as quickly as possible to get to some of the innovations. Um, so we're a trilingual university with three official languages of instruction, German, Italian, and English. Um, we say at our university that B1 proficiency is the bare minimum to follow a lecture. So in most of our degree pro programs, approximately 33% 30, uh, 33 is taught in German, 33.3% in Italian, and 33.3% in English. So our students need some competency, some proficiency in all three languages. Uh, we say that B1 is the absolute minimum. In reality, it's probably B2 to really succeed uh, in our program, B2 in all three languages, and C1 to excel. And this is why we have some of the most uh, strict language requirements in Europe. Um, our entry requirements are not that strict, really. Uh, it's B2 in the first language and B2 in the second language, since most of our students are uh, L1 speakers of German or Italian. The first language is taken care of. And the uh, majority of them have uh, B2 in English. It's not, that's not a big issue. But getting a third language up to the B1 level in order to uh, move on to the second year can be challenging. And then getting two languages to C1 and the third language to B2 for exit requirements is quite demanding for many of our students. Um, we also require B1 just to attempt their exams in their, in their degree program. So they have to reach B1 in the language of the exam. Uh, so if they're taking economics in English, they have to have at least B1 in English in order to attempt their exam in their economics course. Um, these are the requirements for undergraduate programs, for master's programs, and our PhD programs. The, uh, the requirements vary greatly. So those are our language requirements, our trilingual model. Um, I work at the Language Center. I'm the English Language Coordinator at the Language Center. And our Language Center exists for three reasons, and they're all sort of inseparable. Uh, the primary aim is supporting uh, our, the university communi community and its language learning needs because also our academic staff and our administrative staff have to meet some language requirements. Our secondary aim is the actual certification of the language requirements. Um, so making sure that students, students and faculty and staff pass uh, recognized proficiency exams. And the third aim is curriculum monitoring and that's uh, something I'm going to talk a, a little bit about in a, in a moment. Um, to this end, we offer many services. We offer language courses, language proficiency exams, both in-house and external. Um, the external uh, international certificates are the, the Celli Italian exam, the Test Stop German exam, and the Cambridge suite of exams and the IELTS exam, in particular the IELTS academic. Um, we offer language advising and self-directed learning services. Uh, we also offer a number of other language activities, including office hours, tandem partners, uh, field trips, language speed dating, language cafes, skills workshops, exam clinics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of meeting the requirements, our students have to pass a recognized proficiency exam. It's not just a matter of passing a course. They have to pass a recognized proficiency exam in order to meet their language requirements. Um, our internal language proficiency exams have three computer-based modules. Um, first module is reading and listening. The second module is writing. And the third module is speaking. And they have to pass all three modules in order to pass the exam. We offer this uh, five sessions per academic year. And students can enroll for B1, B2, or C1 exam in any of the three languages. These exams are offered free of charge. They have limited external recognition. Uh, we put them on a diploma su supplement, which is our equivalent of a graduation transcript. We also recognize uh, all of the major international language certificates, uh, such as for English, such as Cambridge, IELTS, Jelly Test. Uh, these are also for Italian and German. Uh, but we offer all the major ones, but these are the ones that we offer at the university. For these exams, of course, the students must pay a fee, whether they're taking them at the university or they're taking, taking them external, externally. But we do offer free preparation courses uh, to help them prepare for these exams when we feel they're recognized. And of course, the advantage of these exams is they're recognized uh, all around the world. So if you take an IELTS exam or a TOEFL exam, which we don't offer, but we recognize, um, then for whatever purpose uh, you need that for after graduation or outside the university, that's recognized. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide because I only have uh, 10 minutes, but essentially in order to improve their language, we want our students to take full advantage 
of studying in a trilingual context. We want them to take full advantage of all of our services um, at the Language Center. Um, the language courses that we offer are organized into a modular system, so they, uh, according to the Common European Framework. So we have 14 40-hour modules based on the Common European Framework, and that's for all three languages. Um, students are placed into one of the modules based on either their current certified level when they matriculate or when they enroll for a course, or a placement test if we don't have a record of their uh, current proficiency. Um, we organize our courses into sort of, they alternate between intensive courses and extensive courses. Intensive courses uh, consist of two or three modules, so that's either 80 uh, or 120 hours, and those occur before, between, and after the, the two semesters. Uh, those are really intensive. Uh, those are eight hours per day for two or three weeks. We've made some adaptations for the online teaching, for the remote teaching at the moment where they're six hours per day, but normally those are eight hours per day for two or three weeks. The extensive courses, however, consist of only one module during the semester. Those are four hours per week for 10 weeks during the semester, during each semester. Then we offer language uh, courses. Uh, our language courses teach and test all four language skills, reading, listening, writing, and speaking. Um, our students, in order to pass from one module and move on to the next, they must attend at least 75% and score 60% uh, in the course to move on. They receive no academic credit, and these courses do not uh, uh, satisfy their language requirements. They're only preparing, they're not preparing them for the exam, they're, they're trying to help them increase their proficiency so that they might pass a proficiency exam. And so one of the challenges we have faced, of course, is uh, with no academic credit, with no recognition for the courses, is attendance, enrollment, and motivation. Um, this is sort of how our modular system is organized. We have four learning paths based on the third language. So when our students come to the university, we tell them focus on the third language um, initially, and then focus on the second language. So focus getting on the third language to B1, and then focus on getting it to B2, and then focus on getting the second language up to C1. And so we have these four learning paths based on their starting level, and then we offer all of these additional courses for uh, test preparation and for getting the second language up to C1. I can mention more about that if you want, if you have questions about it, and I can share documents. Okay, so one of the, in our, our system is very complex because it's trilingual. Our students, some of our students are not a native speaker of any of the three languages, some of our international students, um, but most of our students speak uh, German or, in, or Italian as their first language. Uh, it's very rare that we have a speaker of English um, at the university, but that happens sometimes too. Um, and within this context, we've been reflecting um, greatly on curriculum monitoring in recent years because that's one of our uh, primary aims at the Language Center. Oh, get some out of order there. Um, to this end, uh, we've been embracing the idea that uh, Language Center should engage in applied research, which is what a lot of uh, experts and scholars have said in recent years. We've also embraced the idea of the teacher as a researcher, which of course comes from ESP. Uh, English for specific purposes and English for academic purposes, but can be applied to English for general purposes as well. And the concept of uh, uh, English teachers as, as reflective practitioners, the, uh, the concept of reflective practice. And another thing that we've been looking into recently is the role of corpora in TESOL. Um, and so we've been adapting, a, adapting and adopting a data-driven and evidence-based post to language instruction and curriculum monitoring. Uh, which uh, in the end is a big data approach using applying data analytics and data science. So essentially what we're doing is we now have a massive database um, that we are analyzing in a piece of software called Power BI, which is intended for business analytics. It's not intended for research, it's not intended for education, it's usually for business analytics, but we're adapting it to our needs. And we're using this to visualize data from multiple databases and engage in some analyses there. And later in the question and answer, if anyone's interested, uh, I can uh, show you what that looks like. Another thing, one thing that I proposed recently um, to our testing office and to some of our colleagues outside the language center is that we develop a trilingual learner monitor corpus with historical exam responses. Our exams are all computer-based, and so we're saving all of these written texts that students are writing in the exact same exam conditions over and over again. And also, we're, also the uh, oral exam is computer-based, and so they're speaking, and those are all recorded and saved in the database. 
And this is something that we could use for uh, curriculum monitoring and also monitoring um, cohorts of students over many years. So sort of uh, uh, a trilingual learner monitor corpus. Um, how am I doing on time? Am I okay? Yes? Yeah. Okay. okay. One minute over okay. time. One minute over time. Okay, so I'll really just say this last part about the uh, disruption, um, this unintended innovation that we're going through at the moment. Um, so I remember a few years ago at the TESOL Italy National Convention in Rome, Donald Freeman, um, uh, a rather famous TESOLer, um, gave a very interesting plenary address about how disruption leads to innovation and gave many examples of this. And this is something that we've been experiencing directly at the Language Center um, in a very real way in the last uh, several months since March. Um, our internal staff have wanted more flexibility in working hours for many years. Um, we've also had a desperate need for more blended and distance learning to foster autonomy uh, and learner agency. And the problem is there have been many administrative and bureaucratic barriers to implementing these uh, ideas and other ideas. And so innovation has been very, very slow. But as a result of the pandemic, we've been forced to innovate immediately and the, the administration has been forced to accept that. And so we've been, we've been engaging in uh, a smart working. Over, uh, within a week, we had to plan this smart working with teams in OneDrive. Uh, we've moved to remote teaching with uh, using platforms such as Teams, Zoom, Moodle, and many other tools. Our exams, our computer-based exams have been invigilated and proctored entirely online, entirely remotely, everyone working remotely using Zoom and Teams. So Zoom with the students and the teams to stay in contact with your uh, co-proctors and invigilators. Um, and really the current situation is not ideal, uh, but administration and teachers have become much more open-minded and we're all requiring new skills for future innovations and implementations. And so I think this is going to, in the long term, it's going to be a very, uh, all the negative things that have been happening in Italy and around the world, um, I think that uh, for our institution, there can also be some positive um, outcomes as a result of this. So uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any other information during the question or answer or thereafter, uh, don't hesitate to, to get in touch. Okay, thank you. Sorry for going over. No worries. Again, thank you for the uh, wonderful and interesting presentation. As I said, I find your context absolutely fascinating. Um, in addition, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Daniel Bringel, who will um, be talking about a context that, again, I, personally, I'm a little more familiar with, um, academic writing and um, servicing students that, how we innovate to service students that uh, we may not traditionally think of. Great, thank you, Leish. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit today about how IEPs can realize their present potential. Uh, my name is Daniel Bringle, and I'm an English language specialist at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. Uh, so what I mean by present potential is more how we can attract and support ESL students who are already on campus, who are already here on our campuses, uh, enrolled in academic programs. Uh, so to go over that, uh, first I want to just uh, introduce a few of the approaches that my program is using uh, to try to address low enrollment. Uh, then I'm going to focus in on the approach that I'm the most involved with, uh, which is adapting our advanced level courses uh, into these more academic support type courses. Uh, and then finally, if I have some time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how this is working out in the current pandemic and how I foresee uh, this may be being beneficial in the future. Uh, so first, just a little bit of a background about the OU ESL Institute. Uh, we are an IEP. Uh, most of our students are seeking degrees in like engineering, computer science, uh, health sciences, uh, but we do have some non-degree seeking students as well, of course. Uh, our biggest populations come from China and from Saudi Arabia, uh, but we have students from all over the world. Uh, however, as has been mentioned by my colleagues already in this panel, we're dealing with issues in low enrollment. Uh, over the past like four or five years, we've been seeing numbers drop. Uh, as you can see, back in 2015, we had about 180. Uh, this past winter semester, we were down to 37. Uh, and right now we're projecting that fall might be as low as 15, 
so this is a big issue that we've been uh, trying to address over the past while and that we're continuing to try. Uh, so what are some of the ways that OU is trying to address low enrollment? Uh, the Global Engagement Office is like our parent department. And uh, so they have some of the kind of like big, big scale type things that they're doing. Uh, international recruitment, they're trying out using third party for the first time this year. Uh, also grants uh, for um, like education programs and business programs with different countries and organizations. Uh, and probably the biggest one is our Pathways program, uh, which we've been piloting this academic year. And then uh, next academic year, we'll be fully on board for undergrad and graduate with our GAP Pathways program. Uh, more locally though, and the ESL Institute where I work, uh, we've been pursuing local recruitment. Um, I'm here in the Metro Detroit area. Uh, so we have the uh, automotive industry here. Uh, so we've been uh, trying to recruit um, expats uh, and um, other uh, things from local organizations and businesses. Uh, as uh, Michael just said, we're also kind of getting pushed into some innovations that we had been wanting to do for a while with offering online courses and eventually maybe some non-academic courses. Uh, but for the rest of the time right now, I just want to talk about um, what I'm doing with our advanced level courses and how we're trying to make these advanced level courses more uh, helpful uh, for not just students who were already placed into our ESL Institute, uh, but also for students who are currently working in academic programs. Uh, so the first thing I'll focus on is uh, writing, which is kind of my area of expertise. Uh, so I've been adapting our level seven and our level eight writing courses. Uh, level seven is advanced writing for undergraduate students. Level eight is for graduate students. Uh, so how did we find out about this need and how are we trying to address it? Uh, it started with some provisionally enrolled students. Uh, so some students who were being enrolled into graduate or undergraduate programs and their proficiency tests were high enough for them to be partially admitted, but not fully. Uh, so students in those situations have typically been put into our level seven or level eight courses so that they can work on developing uh, some of the skills that they need uh, to succeed in their academic programs. Uh, but then we've also had some problem cases sent our way. Uh, students who are already in academic programs but maybe there's an issue with plagiarism. Or in another case, a student who's in an academic program, but they're really struggling with the writing because they're not experienced with the type of writing that's required of them. Uh, so this really showed us that there's a population out there, a population already on campus who could use our help. And we need to find ways to meet the needs of this population. Uh, so as we all know, the, the TOEFL and other standardized proficiency tests, they're a great tool, but they don't really show us what the students' writing skills would be like in a graduate research course, or even in a first year writing course where the student has to do process writing. Uh, so this is the need that we're trying to kind of fill and a way that we're trying to get some more enrollment in our ESL program uh, from these students who need extra support. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, I wrote down, oh, I guess I typed them. I typed a few uh, kind of features here that I follow when I'm adapting these courses. Uh, first of all is project-based learning. Uh, this isn't really doable if you're following a textbook 100% for a course. Uh, because you're going to end up having uh, students who are not in academic programs and students who are in different academic programs all in the same course, possibly working on different projects for their different courses. Uh, so the course needs to be based around two or three kind of long-term projects that the instructor can support. The instructor can find materials, come up with activities and kind of scaffold these projects. Uh, that also means that there needs to be a lot of flexibility. Flexibility in the syllabus, flexibility in the assignments. Uh, for example, 
uh, one of the courses in this program, uh, students would typically write uh, like a 15 page APA paper that combined secondary and primary research. Uh, but if you're supporting a student who is in a graduate or undergraduate program, maybe they need to use IEEE, or maybe it only needs to be six pages or maybe they don't need to focus as much on primary research, maybe they need to write a more extensive literature review. Uh, so maintaining flexibility in the curriculum is really the only way you can make these academic support classes work when you have all this variety of students. Uh, so that means there's going to be a lot of workshopping uh, and individual conferencing, checking in with the students on their progress. Uh, but then one more thing I added on here is communication with uh, staff and with faculty. Uh, now this isn't always helpful. Uh, sometimes it's very helpful where we'll get sample papers, uh, sample assignments, maybe extra information about the assignment or suggestions from the faculty member. Uh, but it's also happened that I don't get any response at all, uh, just crickets. So uh, this is something that, uh, this is one of my goals with this, is trying to make the communication with other departments and with faculty members more productive so that we can get more helpful materials and suggestions from uh, these departments. Uh, I'm going to skip over those last two there uh, just because of time. I forgot to start my timer, so I hope I'm still doing kind of good on timing. Uh, the, the last thing here I want to mention about adapting courses is that, is that it's not just happening in our advanced writing courses at OU. Uh, that's kind of where it started, but it's happening elsewhere. Uh, so we're moving forward with the GAP program as well, which is really pushing us into this student support model. Uh, so we have our GAP students. We might have some academic support students who aren't in the GAP program. And then we also have our traditional students. Uh, so we're needing to find ways to support all of these students. Uh, so students might be um, reading texts in their academic courses. And so we have them use though the information from those texts in their projects in our ESL courses. Uh, and likewise, uh, because of these projects, we realized other needs for the lower levels in the program. Uh, so we started in our level six writing class, which is like our high intermediate writing class. Uh, we have now started doing a critical analysis paper uh, to help prepare students for the types of film analysis or literary analysis that they might have to do if they're going to be taking one of their gen eds. Uh, okay, how am I doing on timing? I'm sorry about the timer. You're about uh, one minute over time. One minute over. Okay, so just really quickly, last thing here is just that this is continuing in the pandemic. Uh, we haven't really been able to find any new opportunities for students that we need to bring in, but our GAP students have been continuing strong. We've been supporting them in their online academic courses uh, with the same things, with project-based learning, conferencing, communicating. Uh, last thing I want to mention here is just about the face-to-face -face requirement that was a little bit up in the air last week. Uh, now it looks like our students won't be deported, uh, but as of last week, it was looking like we might need a small face-to-face -face option. And this is another thing where student support courses can help. If we do end up in a situation where uh, universities are needing to find some small face-to-face -face course, uh, something like a one credit um, support course could fill that need so that students are um, uh, having the online courses for the rest of their curriculum. That's it for me. Let me thank you so much. <laughs> I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jessica now who will um, be presenting on developing materials for a very specialized uh, discipline in ESP. Hello, yes, thank you. Um, 
I'm going to be sharing about uh, a context that until recently I was working in, and that is a, a very specialized graduate program. And my hope is that some of what I have to share today will be applicable to other programs and may give um, those of you who are program administrators ideas about how you could expand what you're currently offering to uh, help you adapt in this ever-changing world that we're working in. So um, I'm currently teaching at Arcadia University, but until recently, I was working in a seminary teaching context. This is a context in the United States that offers um, very academically rigorous graduate programs in Master of Divinity, a Master of Theology, and PhD programs in Theology, Philosophy, and Church History. So we're working with very rigorous programs that require, among other things, incoming international students to take Greek and Hebrew through English. So they need a high level, an extremely high level of grammatical understanding of English, as well as Greek and Hebrew to be successful. They have to do reading comprehension in 16th to 20th century theological scholars and ancient texts, thousands of pages a semester, and they are also required to have a very high listening comprehension in order to um, be successful. And uh, the institution has about 15 to 30 percent of the whole student body um, being from an international background uh, or a language background where English is not their first language. So as a result, they created a theological English department many years ago, but we've adapted that theological English department significantly in recent years. So one of the things that the department offers is uh, very similar to what Daniel was talking about. Um, we have advanced theological writing courses that are for currently enrolled or matriculated international graduate students. They take a test when they come in to see what their actual writing ability is as they enter. And then there's a series of three courses um, that students can test out of at any time once they have proven that they are able to be successful and write at a high enough graduate level independently. Um, but these are required courses that they have to pass that are taken concurrently with their academic courses and they uh, get support for the papers that they are writing for the genres in which they have to write. And um, we also, in our activities, in our grammar activities, our writing activities, use a lot of content that is directly related to their field of study. Uh, we have found that using um, professionally published ESL materials typically don't meet our students' needs because they're either not quite specific enough for what they need or not quite um, complicated enough, quite high enough a level. We also, in the last seven or eight years, have created an intensive English program with two levels, one for master students and one for students who are headed more into the PhD style programs. Um, and for these two programs, we created most of the textbooks ourselves. So in-house, we've created uh, hundreds of pages of textbooks that focus on genre-specific vocabulary and context. And my area of expertise is actually listening, speaking, pronunciation, and note-taking that area of um, English as a second language. And so uh, we've used a lot of videos of online coursework and videos taken of in-class coursework as the primary listening texts. So this has been really helpful in preparing our students for the specific professors that they will be working with, not just the content, but helping them um, prepare for how to listen to the different professors that they'll be working with, how to adapt to different types of teaching styles that they're going to interact with, how to manage PowerPoints. Um, and uh, one, one thing I did want to mention is that in this COVID-19 time, I'm sure that most of you, your institutions probably house a significantly larger amount of videos that you could perhaps draw on for your programs um, than than has ever existed before. So many people are um, filming videos of short lectures or parts of their teaching in order to post online for their online classes. And if you're able to use those as listening texts for your classes, um, that can be really helpful for your students. Um, also, even before this pandemic hit, almost all of the homework assignments that are possible to do and assessments that we created um, were facilitated online for Easy of, ease of grading, replication, and reuse so that we could move them from semester to semester. Um, much of, I think that's somewhat similar to what Michael was discussing um, with online assessments being saved and reused. And uh, some of the data that can be generated from that can also help with validity, reliability, testing 
those things if, if you're able to use the course management systems that are embedded in your institution to do some of that. We've been able to do some of that and that's been very helpful. So um, what I have to share next are just some examples of the in-house materials that we have created. Here's an example from a note-taking skills lesson that occurs early in the curriculum. So they are using the same lecture for both types, but different, both types of notes, but different parts of the lecture. The lecture, this one is about a hermeneutics and parables, I believe. And so it's the same professor, it's the same speaker, but they are learning how to take notes in a chart and then learning how to take notes in an outline format. And um, this sort of thing does not take too long to design, but if you can um, adapt it to the specific needs of your students, I think it increases both motivation and student satisfaction. Our students in recent years have seemed to be very satisfied with the switch to in-house created materials as opposed to the um, published available ones in this field. Here's another example of how we have dealt with some uh, differences in classroom culture. This is from a listening lesson in the uh, church history field. The bullet points here on the right illustrate the, uh, the order of class and what's being done in this lesson. So first students listen to a clip of a discussion and what they're listening to is not just for content, but for how the professor is interacting with the students. How are they interacting? And what are some of the differences between how this professor in an American context um, is interacting with his students and what the students' expectations might be? Most of our students come from Asian backgrounds and so their classroom dynamics tend to be quite different. So after they've listened to the clip, after they've answered um, basic comprehension questions, then we have a discussion as a class about the verbal and nonverbal interaction that they've observed. Uh, as you can see, I've listed that this is question number 11 in the lesson. So we've gotten to the end here and then the points in italics are some of these suggestions for the teachers on um, topics of conversation that might come up and that, that we can discuss. And then we would put students in small groups to do activity two, which are um, discussing more about their own background with relationship dynamics and what they can expect and see, seeing the models of how they can be expected to interact as well. Um, the third example is from a listening class. And I have here the example text and the skills and objectives that we're working on as we prepare them for this very difficult um, history <laughs> class. Uh, so the major content vocabulary and the lecture listening strategies we would teach in advance, which would be followed by a video of part of a lecture from a real class with a real professor whom they will be working with in the future. While they're watching for this particular lesson, they're able to look at a handout of the professor's PowerPoint. So they're simultaneously watching and listening. They're reading the handout with the professor's PowerPoint that they can annotate and add notes to. But then the focus here is after the lecture, they need to be able to recognize the relationships between ideas. So one of the things we're trying to teach with this lesson is not just managing large amounts of listening and listening comprehension, but also not relying on PowerPoint because you still have to listen for the connections between ideas. And we find that that's um, an area of difference between some of our students' background uh, learning experiences. This is not an environment where they can just learn the facts and then regurgitate them. They need to be able to make connections between ideas in new ways. So here's an example of one of the slides that one of the professors is teaching through. And then here on the right, two of the questions that we would go over at the end of the lesson um, that require them to use what they've listened to and what they've noted about the content in order to process it. And um, in going through this process, we help prepare them for some of the difficulties that they're going to experience when they enter um, the actual program. So real quickly, what are some suggested applications that I thought might be helpful for others in different contexts? Um, I really think it's a great idea in this time, to, if you can, to collaborate with other university departments, whether graduate or undergraduate, to tailor your current English course offerings to specific departments. Um, not only have we found this to increase student satisfaction, but it also enables you to be um, 
more relevant to the different departments at your institution. And you know, to, to get some other people in your corner to say, no, we need this program here. They're supporting our students in our major. Um, it can also help support student success. So if you can think of some departments that you're not currently working with, that you might be able to um, interact with, that could help you to survive in this time period. And then as I mentioned, utilizing your institution's bank of videos, wherever that is housed, um, that's been created for online learning can help you to create specific high interest lessons or help your teachers to create specific high interest lessons that um, don't require as much um, personal generating of material because it's available for you and you can uh, be fairly confident that it will be of interest to the students. And then uh, thirdly, digitizing assessments by moving them to course management systems if possible. Um, many of us are now doing this because we have no choice, <laughs> but we found even in classes that stay in the classroom, digitizing our assessments as much as possible, particularly reading and listening, but then allowing for speaking and writing samples to be uploaded before they're independently graded um, has really helped. So thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation, Jessica. Um, we have time for, I guess, for one or two questions. Um, um, however, we strongly encourage you to reach out to our presenters today um, if you do have further questions and um, use uh, their contact information. Um, as a reminder, we will be providing all of the presentations in the program administration interest section library for your perusal. And um, from monitoring the questions, um, I'd like to open this question to everyone on the panel um, as, a, as everyone kind of touched upon it. Um, it comes from uh, Adam McConnell, who uh, states that it would be interesting to hear our insights on designing an online multi-level program while meeting the needs of students of various levels in a single class. Um, I think I can mention something, Liz. Um, we are currently having uh, multi-level courses and uh, we try to group them, uh, let's say by sub-level. So let's say A1, A2 uh, on the one hand and uh, B1, B2 together. And what we focus in those cases is on the uh, uh, major objectives, the descriptors that the Common European Framework or the Pearson Global Scale of English uh, provides, and we work on those uh, uh, in the um, virtual classes, okay? So we post activities that develop uh, or that foster the development of uh, speaking or writing, listening, uh, geared to uh, meeting the objectives at the sub-level. It's challenging, yes, it is, but uh, we also feel that uh, students uh, at different uh, skill, at, at different levels of their own uh, development can help each other and they can also profit from this interaction, okay? because the lower level can learn from the higher level and the higher level can develop strategies for making himself under understood. So, okay, that, that's, uh, those are some ideas that uh, can be useful for everyone. Thank you. Uh, any, any other uh, comments from the panel? Um, I know Michael wrote something in chat. Uh, Daniel, did you have something? I have something I could add there, uh, just something we're planning to do in the fall. Uh, we're going to be combining two of the writing classes I was talking about in my presentation. So the, the level eight graduate class and the level seven undergraduate class will now be combined and online. Uh, so one thing we're going to try doing is uh, both levels together on a Monday in a synchronous session uh, and trying to do the things that we can do together in that session. Uh, then having the lower level in synchronous sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays, while then having the higher level in synchronous sessions on Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, that way we can still kind of individualize and differentiate while combining when we need to. 
if yeah if i may just add something i think um in general look you know the the importance of building community amongst the students and the faculty um, is um, critical in the online delivery mode and so um, you know i think you uh, program administrators and curriculum developers have to be very intentional in finding technologies that um, facilitate that community building um, and allow that uh, allow for these sort of extemporaneous uh, connections, communicative connections to be built between students and faculty. Um, and we know that brings so many good uh, effective variables for language acquisition. A uh, second question uh, comes from Irene, and it's uh, directed towards Daniel. Um, and she asked, uh, who pays for your academic support services and how? And are there other academic support providers on campus? And if so, how have you handled territorial competition? OK, that's a good question. Uh, so first of all, I should mention that our academic support courses are not separate. They are part of our ESL curriculum. So if someone is working through the ESL curriculum, <clears throat> they would have to work up through those levels. Uh, but making them an optional support course, uh, that would be something where a department or an individual student would decide what kind of help they need, and then they would choose to take that class. Uh, so usually it would be the student that pays for it. Uh, these are non-credit courses, so they are significantly cheaper than credit courses are at the university. Uh, but it has happened where a department paid for it. I mentioned those problem cases. In those problem cases, the department ended up paying for those students to take the ESL courses. Uh, so uh, that's something that uh, is kind of one of my goals, is to make departments more aware of the service we can provide uh, so that students know about it, departments know about it. It's not just like a scrambling. Uh, and then that goes to the second part of your question, Irene, then, uh, is that uh, we do have other student support services at OU. Uh, we have the Writing Center, uh, which was where I came from before I became an ESL instructor. Uh, and then we also have the Tutoring Center. Uh, so with the Writing Center, I know uh, we do a lot of collaborating. We are in constant communication with the Writing Center about the students that we are sending to them. And then they have some situations where they even recommend students to us. Uh, so I guess my answer for that question is just, um, communication and that we're not 100% there. We're trying to get there and we're trying to make the campus more aware of our ability to support students. Thank you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. And the last question that we have for today's webinar it comes from Michael uh, and he's asking uh, our fellow panelists, uh, since he doesn't have any direct experience with uh, intensive English programs in the United States, in our experience, what percentage of the program deal with the kinds of academic skills and communication training that were mentioned in Jessica's presentation uh, for international students? And when do these students go to writing centers instead? Um, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to step back and let my other colleagues in IEPs on the panel uh, answer that question first. I was trying to start my video without my dogs barking like lunatics, or I would have said something earlier. Um, <laughs> the hazards of Zoom. I, I wanted to kind of piggyback on what Daniel said in a way too, in that the importance of cross collaboration across the university is really important. And we actually have faculty members that include the writing center as part of their required cor course requirements in that you know but the writing center has some caveats in that not everyone is trained to work with esl writers or the problems that esl writers typically have so when we have up and this is only in our really upper level classes um and but we do work careful very closely with them as well and that and we used to have at tech 
a um, we used to have classes for GTAs and G and GRAs and pronunciation communication and all of those have kind of fallen by the wayside recently and so we are trying to fill that gap. Um, we are starting a master's level pathway program right in the middle of COVID because that's a good thing to do right um, and and so you know working hopefully that will help departments realize that we're a resource for those students who not maybe they have the TOEFL requirements for the graduate school but need a little extra help and we do also get a lot we do we're fortunate in that we do get referrals from departments but those students tend to come in undergraduate and graduate level um, usually are j1 or scholars and the departments will pay for them often to come to classes depending on the department um so uh try to think yeah so They'll, they'll go to writing centers when they need more, so oftentimes more content based stuff and the work on the paragraph essay structure and come to us if they need more grammatical um, structures and sentence structure. Um, in, in my most recent context, the entire uh, seminary was in this essence almost like a department itself. And so, um, the entire seminar was aware of the program and all international students were required to take this writing test and take the classes if, if they qualified for them. But I, I don't think that that kind of integration is common in a lot of other um, institutional situations. And in some of my previous experience at other universities, I think there are significant holes still in connecting departments with intensive English programs. And there's a lot of space there for potential growth. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. That's definitely been in my experience. And, um, you know, to, to Michael's uh, question, I would say that uh, an IEP has sort of two raison d'etre, you know, it's like the first is developing the um, language skills that, you know, the four traditional modalities of the students, but the other a very important pillar is the academic acculturation what, that we were talking about. How do you appropriately participate in a seminar style uh, course when perhaps culturally that's not a very common mode of instruction in, in your home culture? You know, how do you uh, write in the academic register, right? And what are these sort of phrases and, and, and sort of the uh, socio-pragmatic context of, of that sort of thing. And that's both general and, and again, to uh, the point of Jessica's presentation, it's also highly domain specific. Um, I teach in a school that's primarily a business school. And so, you know, we have to acculturate our students into writing executive summaries and business plans and, you know, things that, um, you know, my bachelor's was in humanities with a minor in classics. I am, you know, I I have no idea. So, um, you know, uh, that gets also to the point of teacher as researcher in the ESP. But um, we could talk for another three hours, but unfortunately, uh, we must conclude today's online program. Today's presentation was titled Innovating and Adapting Programs and Materials When Anything's, Everything is Changing. I'd like to give a special thank you to our presenters and also to my co-host, Tracy McGee. This concludes the program and you may disconnect. <laughs>